Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this through the grace of Christ Jesus. Amen. I am coming to to the place where I'm starting to, to understand, and I don't know if you're at this place or not, but starting to understand that keeping Sabbath might be one of the most profound things people do to set us apart as God's people. Now, I know Scripture has lots of things that says to us, that it says to us about what it means to God's, be God's people. But I am coming to see that keeping Sabbath might be one of the most profound things that anyone can do that sets us apart as God's people. And I think that's true because of all the things that God commands people to do, of all the things that God has has put into the world, Sabbath is something that was there from the beginning. We read in in Genesis chapter 2 that God has completed the six days of creation. And it says, on the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. Right at the beginning, there is Sabbath. Now, you know, you look at that and you think, okay, why does God rest? I I wrestled with that question for a little while. Does God rest because, you know, creating six days just wore him out and he's got nothing left? Uh, does, he, does he rest from his labor because he just, he can't go anymore? Is everything that he, everything created that's ever going to be created done? I don't think so. God doesn't rest because he needs to. God rests because that's the way he creates the world. And he creates the world as a, as a play, uh, with rest and Sabbath as a part of it, not for him, but for us, for the creatures that he creates. And you will find from that moment on, God is continually talking to his people about Sabbath and about rest. So that when you get to the Ten Commandments, and you look at these ten things that God has, has says to Israel, all the other laws I'm going to give you are summarized in these ten things. There is Sabbath. It's the only thing in the Ten Commandments that goes all the way back to creation. And he says, he writes in Exodus chapter 20, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest dedicated to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. And that's why the Lord blessed the seventh Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. It's actually a day that Genesis and the Ten Commandments in Exodus calls a holy day. And you can begin to see now why it might well be one of the most profound things that, that sets us apart as God's people about keeping Sabbath. It's something God has put into creation. It's something at the heart of what it means to be God's people, Israel. And it continues. And so we come now to Mark chapter 2, and we find another Sabbath story. It's fascinating to me how often the Gospels tell us Jesus does things on the Sabbath. And on, in this case, it's not what Jesus does, it's what his disciples do. They are walking through this field, and they're hungry. And so they pick off pieces of grain. And that was legal to do that. You could pick off some bits of, of grain of a field as you were walking through it if you were hungry. It's part of God feeding people who have needs, caring for people who have needs. But the Pharisees are upset about it, and they say to Jesus, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? It's one thing to pick it up and eat it. It's another thing to what they, would, they call harvest it. Because when they, when they picked it off of, of the stalk, then they were reaping 
grain. But then to eat it, you had to sort of crush it up in your hand to get to the good parts inside. And that was grinding grain. And both of those things are, are unlawful to do on the Sabbath day. And so the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, why are your disciples doing this? Now, there's one sense in which the Pharisees, they are concerned about keeping the Sabbath. Because God said through his prophets, uh, Ezekiel and others, one of the reasons that the people go into exile, that they are banished and taken, their countries destroyed by the Babylonians is because they don't keep the Sabbath. And so, there is, in one sense, they are trying to keep, trying to get people to keep the law, keep the Sabbath, so that they do not incur the same kinds of punishments. But there is something deeper going on here. They are missing the point of Sabbath. Sabbath is not just about rules. It's about something more. And they have completely missed it. I think Anne is right. They're wanting to exercise their power. They're wanting to, they're wanting to, they're trying to, first of all, they're trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to condemn Jesus. Ultimately, it's because of all the things Jesus does on the Sabbath that they ultimately come to the place where they say, something's got to be done about this guy. And the very next story at the beginning of chapter three is they go to the synagogue and Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. And here's the thing that strikes me as I think about what they're doing and what, how Jesus responds. And Jesus says to them, have you not read the scriptures? I love it when he says that to them because these are people who know the scriptures more than anybody else in Israel. Have you not read the scriptures? What do the scriptures say? David and his companions were on the run from Saul. He wasn't even king yet. He's on the run from Saul trying to, trying to keep his life. And they are hungry, desperately hungry. And he goes to, to the tabernacle. And there the priest is, is there. And he has the, the special bread that only priests are allowed to eat. And God made that very clear. And David says, you have anything to eat? He says, all I've got is this. And David says, I think, I, can I have it? And the priest says, yes. Because a human need is more important than keeping the rules. As important as the rules are. And I think one of, the, one of the things about this story that strikes me is, that, is, is our understanding of what Sabbath is to be. I suspect if you grew up in the church, probably a lot of your mindset about Sabbath is just rule after rule after rule. And the church got into creating so many rules because we didn't want to break the Sabbath. And so we are so good at saying, let's make a checklist so we don't break the, so we don't break the Sabbath. And most of what was done was what you cannot do. But that's not Sabbath's intent. That's why I think, when we think about a road sign for Sabbath, I think the, road, the best road sign is, is next exit. I think what God is saying is you're on this journey, you're driving on this journey, you're on the road, and the human tendency is to go as long and as far as we can without stopping because we want to get there. And God keeps saying, but I want you, but here's an exit where I want you to pull off. I want you to rest. And it's not just about rest, it's not just pulling off because of a crisis, you know, if you're really driven and you're, and you're on this journey and you're thinking, I've got to get there as fast as I can and I've got to make as much time as I can, as much progress as I can, accomplish as much as I can, the only time you stop is when you absolutely have to. I'm about out of gas. I've got to eat or I'll faint. You know, we, we, we keep going and going and going and going until we absolutely have to. But that's not what Sabbath is about. Sabbath is about a regular rhythm of pulling off at an exit. Not just because we feel like, oh, I'm so exhausted I can't go any further. But because it becomes a part of the routine of our journey. And sometimes it is in desperation. I remember years ago, Cindy and I were driving from Kentucky to Iowa. It's about an 18-hour drive. We would visit her parents. We had minimal time. So we wanted to get there as quickly as we, could, as we could. And so we drove straight through, 18 hours. And I remember driving through the night, and we were getting low on gas and trying to find a gas station 
that was open in the middle of the night was difficult. And I know both of us were starting to panic that we were going to run out of gas at 2 or 3 in the morning. We finally were able to find a place. I don't think that's exactly the kind of thing God's talking about. I think it's more of a regular rhythm of saying, you know what, we've been driving a little while, time to stop. Are you hungry? Well, maybe not, but let's stop anyway. Do we need gas? I don't know. Well, let's stop anyway. Because it's about the regular routine of rest that God has built into the universe. And we tend to think, I'm only going to rest when I have to. God says, I created you to rest. A.J. Swoboda in his book, Subversive Sabbath, says, it's an interesting thing that the first full day that human beings spend on this earth is a Sabbath day. I'd never thought about that before. When they get up, they're created on the sixth day. When they wake up on the seventh day, it's a Sabbath day. And he goes on to say that, you know, it takes about, social scientists tell us it takes about 100 milliseconds to make a judgment about somebody that we look at or have an interaction with. We do that very quickly. Imagine their impression of God when they wake up that first morning expecting to work and God says, oh, no, no, we're going to rest. Think about the kind of God that is. And he makes the point that, you know, when you look at creation and you look at how God designed human beings, if you really stop and think about it, we tend to think rest comes after we work. But in God's plan with human beings, rest comes so we can work. Completely different from how the gods of all the other ancient Near Eastern nations think about their people. In all the other ancient Near Eastern myths and the stories of their gods, they drive people. They drive people to exhaustion. They drive people, they work them to the bone. They keep driving them, driving them, driving them until they can't do anything more. More and more demands. Sort of like the Israelites in Egypt. Because they're relate, the God's relationship to human beings is they want to enslave them. They want to put them into bondage. They want to drive them till they drop because it's all about what you can do for the gods. But Yahweh is not like that. That's why he keeps talking about Sabbath. It's only when sin enters the world that human beings begin to think that God wants to drive us to exhaustion. God didn't drive Adam and Eve to exhaustion in the garden. It was only after they sinned that their view of God was skewed and their view of work was skewed and their view of Sabbath and rest was skewed. And we have inherited all of that. Until now we think what God wants from us is more, more, more. We don't have time to rest. There's too much to do, too much to accomplish, too much to get done. And God keeps saying to us, no, you've gone far enough, let's pull off here. There's a sign for something that looks interesting, let's go off here. Let's take that exit. Because that's who God is. And I think we struggle with Sabbath because we're not really sure that's what it's about. One of the things about about the road signs is some road signs are warnings. And we've talked about a few of those, speed limit, railroad crossing. Some signs are information. Next exit is really an invitation. It's an invitation to, hey, here's a place to eat. Here's a place to stop. Here's a place to get gas. Here's something to do. You see, if you drive down the highway and you see all these billboards, all these things, these are invitations. No one is making us stop at those things. We have to decide that we're going to do it. And God gives us Sabbath. God has created the world for Sabbath. He's created us for Sabbath. And then he invites us to keep it. And to practice it. It's a gift. It's not a burden. It's a gift. You know, I just had a birthday a month or so ago. And, and I received a number of gifts from my family that day. 
I didn't look at any of those as thinking, oh, man, that's a burden. Why would you give me that? This is going to kill me. No. Every one of those gifts is like, oh, I can't wait to read that book. I can't wait to do that puzzle. I can't wait to wear those clothes. You know, over and over and over again. You know, all these things, they're gifts that we enjoy. Why is it if our, if, if, as to paraphrase Jesus, if we who are, who are less than perfect want to give gifts for enjoyment to our, to our friends and family, why would we think God wouldn't do the same thing? It's what he does for us. It's a gift to us. And over and over again, God says, the gift of Sabbath I'm giving to you, you just need to practice it and do it and embrace it. Now, here, now you need to understand this. Sabbath is not an elimination of work. Because work's a part of creation, too. Work is also a gift of God. To be able to create things, to be able to see things, to, to plant and watch things grow, to be able to make things, to be able to, to do all these things in the world. This is a gift of God that He's given us to create and to make and to do. As Andy Crouch says, we're not... We're not cruise ship passengers just sitting back doing nothing on our journey. No, we're part, we're part of the crew. Our problem is we think that our worth and our values in what we accomplish instead of in our relationship with our Creator. And the point of Sabbath is to enhance our relationship with our Creator and our relationship with each other. Really, Sabbath is, is one of the primary ways that we carry out what Jesus says are the two greatest commandments, to love God and to love others. It's not about what we accomplish. It's about relationships. If it was all about what we accomplish, then God would never have created Sabbath. But he does. And one of the questions that continues to arise for us as we think about about Sabbath is, so what do we do? You know, what's right and what's wrong to do on Sabbath? And, and just the very fact that we all want to ask that question brings us back to the Pharisees and let's make a checklist. And that's not what God does. Now, there are some things that God says, don't do that on the Sabbath, don't do that on the Sabbath, do this, do this. And, and that's because he wants to set some general boundaries. But actually, when you think about it, Sabbath is, it, what we do on Sabbath, it's the kind of things that are life-giving to us. It's things that, that bring wholeness, that bring restoration to us. It, it's things that, instead of, we often think of Sabbath as freedom from, instead of freedom to. And Sabbath is really about the freedom freedom we now things we now can do that we can't do under the stress and the strain of work so we have freedom to play we have freedom to have fun in a way that we can't when it's work 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 we have freedom to rest to sleep a little bit more than we can during the the other 6 days of our week we have freedom to love we have freedom to give. We, it's important to understand that while Sabbath is an individual thing, it's not just an individual thing. Because if our Sabbath is, is about making self-centered decisions, then it will not be restorative as God intends it to be. There is a place for us to spend, maybe have some time for self some time maybe to read the scriptures a little more, to pray a little more, to spend time with God a little more. But it also ought to include family and probably some friends who we connect with. It's a time to, to, to say, what would our children want to do? How do we spend more? How can we spend more? It's a time to spend more time with family and friends just in enjoying each other and caring for each other and loving each other. We have time Taken to step out of the driving uh, that we do six days a week that's continually on us so that we build relationship deeper with God and relationship deeper with others. And instead of making a checklist, we just start thinking about, okay, God, how can I, 
What, what can I do on this day? What does this what does day look like that would help me to draw closer to you and closer to others? That's why worship has typically been a part of, of Sabbath. To draw closer to God in our worship and to each other. It is a time for us to step back and say, it's not about accomplishments, it's about relationships. I used to think, I used to say this, one of the reasons that we, we do Sabbath is, because, is, a, is a trust factor of God. And we say, I believe that if I, if I take Sabbath, God will help me accomplish more in six days than I can in seven. I'm not sure I believe that anymore. I'm not sure that's the best motivation. Because as A.J. Swoboda says, maybe, maybe one of the lessons God wants to teach us with Sabbath is to leave some things undone and to be okay with it. And trust them to Him. One of the hardest things about Sabbath is that we haven't finished everything. And we need to finish everything. But the reality is, do we ever finish everything? And it's an ability to say, God, I did the best that I could. I worked hard. I, I didn't get it to where I'd like it to be. But it's time and I need to step away from it. And I'm going to trust that you will handle that either the next day or in some other way. I think sometimes, I'll say this about myself and maybe this is true of you. Sometimes leaving some things undone is a challenge to my pride. And it's a challenge to, to the fact that uh, so much of our value and worth is in what we accomplish. And if we leave some things undone, not because of laziness, but because we just didn't finish it, and we take Sabbath, then maybe what we're really saying is, God, I'm making a declaration that my value and my worth is not what I accomplish. It's about my relationship with you. And even if we're on our journey, we haven't gotten as far as we'd like to, the rhythm of the journey says, now's the exit to take. And I take it. And I spend some time in nature. I spend time with, with people I love. I spend a little more time with God. It's not about accomplishing anything. It's about relationships. One of the things about this passage that strikes me, the, two, the last two verses, Jesus says the Sabbath was not made, the Sabbath was made for you, not you for the Sabbath. And I think that is essential for us to keep in mind. The Sabbath is for us. It is a gift to us that God's given us. And then Jesus says, so therefore, Jesus, he himself, is Lord of the Sabbath. If Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, that means he's the Lord of time. And if Jesus is Lord of time, that means he's the Lord of everything. Why do we practice Sabbath? Because we believe, it's a declaration we believe, that Jesus is Lord. Period. That he is Lord, not you, not me. That he runs the world, not you, not me. That all things are in his hands, not yours, not mine. He's Lord. Dorothy Day, who did so much work in, in uh, New York City back in the earlier part of the 20th century, made this statement that Christians are commanded to live in a way that doesn't make sense unless God exists. When I read that, I thought, I think there's another way to say that, too. Christians are, com are commanded to live in a way that, that makes sense only if Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, it's connected to Sabbath. Then that means... That our, every time we observe Sabbath and let Sabbath be a part of the rhythm of our lives, we are declaring Jesus is Lord. And that's why I think it is one of the most profound 
things people can do to set ourselves apart as the people of God. To acknowledge this gift, to remember this gift, to live in this gift, to shake our, shape our lives around this gift that God has given us. I read something interesting this week that uh, they, they did a social experiment. They built a playground, but they didn't put a fence around it. And they let the children come and play. What was interesting is they had all these things spread out all over the playground, but all the children stayed right in the middle of the playground. They all just stayed right in the middle without the fence. After a few days of that, they put up a fence. And you know what happened? The children played all over the playground. Something about the fence gave them a sense of security and a sense of freedom to play and to not have fear. And I think there's something of Sabbath in that. That God is saying to us, I'm creating this fence for you. And it may look like a restriction, but it's a gift. Because it gives you the freedom to rest, to be, and to know and declare that I am Lord. And you don't have to live as if you are. I don't know what it will mean for you to start or maybe enhance your practice of Sabbath. I would say start small. If you're not doing anything, take half a day. But start getting into a routine. And here's the thing. You will, will be opposed every time that comes around. There will always be things to do. There will always be stuff to look at. The evil one's going to continue to, to fight us. And some people say, i got to keep working because the devil doesn't, doesn't take a Sabbath. And two things come to my mind. One is, I don't think we want the devil to be our model. <laughs> and second, God's response to the unrelenting drivenness of the devil is Sabbath. And that's his gift to you and me. Father, we want to thank you for your grace and mercy to us in giving us Sabbath rest. Help us to see this gift for what it is. Let us embrace it and find life in it and joy in it and you in it. Through the grace of Christ Jesus, amen.